Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the Ghent University Consortium on Research Consortium on Global Change Archives. Uh, this is an interfaculty consortium of five research groups uh, from the departments of biology, geology and soil science, and applied analytical and physical chemistry. Um, our combined research focus um, is climate and biosphere dynamics at short and long time scales from decades to millions of years, exploiting the natural archives of environmental change recorded in soils, peats, and the sedimentary deposits of oceans and lakes. Our structure is basically that it simply clusters the domain-specific research initiatives by seven professors and their postdocs, together producing three to four PhDs and about 70 A1 publications annually. What is the context for this um, research cluster? Well, we've seen these figures um, showing the prognosis of climate change, of global climate change, um, over the next century and over up to the next three, 300 years um, in reports by IPCC. For the next 100 years, it seems to be that the vari variation in realized temperature change mostly depends on differences uh, in the emission scenarios, the amount of greenhouse gases that will actually be emitted. When we look further into the future, and particularly in the area where, um, in, in case the Earth will be substantial, we see that the uncertainty uh, in the actual prognosis uh, becomes much larger, indicating that indeed um, our understanding of climate dynamics and the way that are incorporated in the climate models um, is still not quite good enough. Um, now the performance of those models that are used to predict the future are tested uh, by checking how well they are able to replicate the actual reconstructions of how climate has changed in the past. This is a good example where these colored lines show simulations by different climate simulation models um, of northern hemisphere temperature over the past 1,000 years. Yeah? These models being forced with the known natural and anthropogenic climate drivers. The natural climate drivers are volcanic eruptions. They are reconstructed from, um, from the acidity of ice cores and variability in solar activity, which is reconstructed from cosmogenic isotope records, also in ice cores and in tree rings. And then, of course, there are the anthropogenic climate drivers, most importantly, the uh, change in uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, compensated in part also by cooling caused by air pollution or aerosols. And uh, the main purpose of this figure is actually to show that indeed um, the, the, simulated, uh, the simulations uh, done by the uh, climate models yeah, is, uh, matches the actual history of uh, northern hemisphere temperature variability quite well if indeed the, um, the anthropogenic drivers of climate change are taken into account because only then the warming of the last century is replicated uh, correctly. The actual reconstructions in this uh, particular uh, plot are shown by, these, uh, by this gray shading. Yes? How is this derived from the reconstructions? Well, here in the top plot you see a, a number of different reconstructions, again of northern hemisphere temperature, um, which is based on different combinations of uh, records, proxy records from natural archives, such as tree rings, vast lake sediments, spilithems, which are stalagmites or stalactites, ice cores and corals. All of those natural archives of climate change have an annual resolution, so we can count them year by year for a thousand years. Um, but depending on the selection of the available archives, also their geographical distribution, um, and also statistical techniques to construct one composite 1,000 year record out of short sections of, of archive, yes, um, result in different actual re hemisphere-wide reconstructions, which are represented by these different colored lines. Each of those lines has a certain uncertainty envelope in the reconstruction, and then the lower plot shows the overlapping uh, and uncertainty envelopes of all the reconstructions, basically reflecting that during certain point, uh, periods of time, such as in this period in the 1400s, um, this very dark area shows that 
uh, most of the reconstructions agree that the anomaly of temperature during the time hemisphere-wide was about this much. In other periods of time, the, the color, the shading is lighter red, showing that there is more disagreement between the reconstructions. But in any case, yeah, um, the comparison of the simulations with those reconstructions show that recent warming of the last century can only be explained by taking into account anthropogenic drivers of climate change. Should this come as a surprise? Well, perhaps not. Um, after all, yes, um, in, in just the last 100 to 200 years, there has been an order of magnitude increase in global, popul in global population. Um, only barely 100 years ago, um, the global population was less than 2 billion, and now we're approaching 8 billion. At the same time also, uh, as industrial development increased, the per capita energy use that for, of each person yes, has multiplied also an order of magnitude yeah, uh, between uh, such that uh, an average person living in a post-industrial society like modern-day Europe is about 20 or 30 times higher than the total energy consumption uh, of a person growing up in a society uh, based on subsistence agriculture, such as still the case in many places uh, in Africa. Yes? And uh, which was also the case for most people in Europe barely 200 or 300 years ago. So you can clearly see that there is a, a two orders of magnitude increase um, in the total uh, pressure of the human population on uh, Earth's natural resources just within a few centuries. So the big question is, how can we assess the real magnitude of human impact on the various components of Earth's support system when quantitative instrumental data extend at best one century and most often only a few decades, namely the time period of globally integrated satellite, Im uh, satellite images? Well, um, one of my favorite examples uh, in, in showing the emphasis of, this, of obtaining this long-term perspective is this record of the dust flux yes, um, into the uh, eastern tropical Atlantic Ocean over the past uh, 3,000 years. Yes? Uh, we tend to think that the amount of dust that is blown from the Sahara or from the Sahel region into the Atlantic Ocean um, is proportional to whether the climate in those regions is rather dry or wet. Yes, when there is a uh, great drought, then of course there will be a lot of open soil and all of that soil will be uh, created, uh, turned into dust and flow in, uh, blown into the ocean. When the climate is a little bit wetter, vegetation can grow and it will hold the, the dust down. Yes, um, well, but if you, that may be the case, at an interannual time scale from year to year or between wet seasons and dry seasons. But if you look at the relevant longer time scale, and, and that is of course the time scale going back thousands of years, you can see that there is simply an exponential steady and exponential increase in the amount of dust flux um, blown into the ocean as this region evolved from uh, an original low population density indigenous society to a colonial society and then the post-colonial society with modern day uh, industrial uh, agriculture. And that this evolution, yes, is quite unrelated to the reconstruction of climate change of the succession of wet and drier periods over the same period, reconstructed independently uh, from uh, oxygen isotopes in the sediments of Lake Bezumtwi nearby. So uh, it's very important uh, to have uh, a correct uh, long-term perspective. Uh, now, when thinking of the, of the changes that may occur into, uh, in the next uh, few centuries, we have to think about, uh, we are looking for periods in the past which are analogous to the situation that will occur in the next few centuries when the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, will be rising from its present day level um, up to 550 or even close to a thousand parts per million. Yes? Um, we already know that the present day level yes, is higher than it has ever been in the last 800,000 years as reconstructed from air bubbles in ice and Antarctica. And um, to basically find an analog of a situation um, of uh, a world with uh, greenhouse, uh, with 
carbon dioxide concentrations of around 550, and so a lower emission scenario for 2100, we basically have to go back about 15 million years. Uh, the higher emission scenario, we actually have to go back over 30 million years at the time when not even the, the Antarctic ice sheet was existing. Yeah? So we are changing global climate so rapidly that we really have to look very far back in time to find analogs, uh, a reference frame for how the, the world may uh, look like in just a few centuries ahead. So the rationale of the, of the consortium is then is that the study of the system Earth, climate history and biosphere evolution is essential for a valid evaluation of the impact of human activities on Earth's life regulating processes. And there is cl clearly increasing appreciation for the importance of this research domain reflected in newly dedicated research centers both in Belgium and abroad. The University of Leuven has started a Sustainable Earth Research Center. In Utrecht, there is a Netherlands Earth System Science Center. And universities of Aachen, Bonn and Köln and the Federal Institute of Jülich have formed the Geoverbund System Erde Mensch. And this is only in the immediate surroundings of, oh sorry, yeah, immediate surroundings of Ghent. Yeah? But in fact, the volume and the quality of Ghent University's PhDs and publications related to global change archives matches that of existing research centers all over Europe. So clearly Ghent University has an important knowledge pool, knowledge pool or excellence cluster in this type of research. Um, so it's my pleasure to give a brief overview of the type of problems that we work on. Most of our research in these groups uh, focuses on sedimentary archives from lakes, um, uh, small lakes and large lakes, and also uh, coastal margin sediments and deep ocean systems, which are, which are sampled with ever bigger equipment. In my own group, we focus on, um, on trying to get a better understanding of the dynamic climate dynamics that cause um, variability in monsoon rainfall in East Africa. And this is because there is a clear discrepancy or uh, discrepancy between on the one hand the prognosis by IPCC uh, from global climate simulation models predicting that uh, Eastern Africa will become wetter over the next century and the facts on the ground showing that the actual data that over the past half century uh, parts of Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, the Horn of Africa, have increasingly become drier and particularly uh, during the agricultural growth season uh, of, of March to June. And of course, leading to ever uh, more severe um, uh, human catastrophes of drought, hunger and disease. Um, so one of the ways we do this is that we reconstruct um, changes in past climate, in past rainfall and drought from lake sediment trackers, like here, Lake Nayavasha, over the last 1,000 years using a combination of biological and non-biological uh, proxies to indicate when in the past it was dry and when it was wetter. And these records are then compiled, yes, on a regional basis all across East Africa to get a better feel, yes, for the area of East Africa um, that is completely dependent for its moisture on the Indian Ocean and the area that also uh, receives additional moisture from the from the Atlantic Ocean yes and so um, currently um, we are uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a federally funded project we are increasing the numbers of those sites uh, producing high resolution reconstructions allowing us to improve yes this regional spatially integrated record of past climate variability with which the next generation climate models can be tested um, another focus of our research deals with then um, how interactions of humans with the landscape, with climate, has evolved in the, the past thousand years. And particularly um, the transition between indigenous societies who adapted to this cli dynamic climate uh, history um, and more modern day societies um, where, which have organized themselves such that they are actually overriding 
yes, the natural climate variability and have a much greater impact on the landscape and on natural resources in general. We use this, we do this with um, proxies of environmental change, of landscape change from the terrestrial environments that are also preserved in the lake sediments and some examples of those are the charcoal which of course reflects the burning of biomass on the landscape, spores of coprophilic fungi which trace pastoralist activity, uh, the size of grass pollen which show you when certain uh, exotic cereals were introduced um, and organic matter carbon and nitrogen isotopes which reflect nutrient budgets of lakes and therefore also the amount of soil erosion in the surrounding uh, landscape. Um, then a few examples um, of research conducted um, at the Protestology and Aquatic Ecology Group, also Biology Department. Uh, they are focusing mostly uh, on climate and environmental history of Antarctica and the, uh, the high latitude southern hemisphere around it. And uh, most of this is done in the context of the fact that uh, although the East Antarctic ice sheet is the most stable ice sheet ice cap on the world, there are indications that it may be less stable than generally thought and therefore um, that it may start melting more rapidly than we, than we think, um, even within the next few centuries. And, if that, is the, and, and that can be traced uh, using altimeter data from satellites, but which need to be corrected for the uplift which is occurring by the continent itself as the weight of the ice is becoming less. Yes, and this uplift is, is spatially heterogeneous and can be derived, yes, the sensitivity of the local crust to uplift can be derived from the deglacian history which occurred after the last major ice age 20,000 years ago. And so this group is indeed then exploiting uh, sediment cores extracted from uh, lakes, yes, on the Antarctic, pen Antarctic Peninsula, other areas around Antarctica, um, to develop chrono sequences yes, of the timing exactly when a particular lake basin was lifted out of the ocean because of the isostatic rebound after the ice uh, cap had retreated from the margin of the continent. Yes? And this uh, chrono sequence is then this red line is used to test whether the output of different kinds of models, yeah, these blue uh, labels here, uh, better or not fit the data and basically incorporate all of the essential parameters. Another focus uh, of this group deals with the, um, the post-glacial history of climate in southern hemisphere high latitude regions, uh, which basically have to do with the exact position of the polar front, yes, which separates the Antarctic climate dynamics from the um, south and mid-latitude climate dynamics. And this can be done based on um, sediment records from lakes uh, on subantarctic islands, like here in South Georgia, where you can see that, um, that productivity indicators, which in those environments are basically a temperature proxy, yes, um, that if you look at the last 7,000 years in this case, that's during certain periods of time, um, the rec it seems to behave more uh, like Antarctica and at other periods of time these lakes have a behavior that seems to be driven by events happening in the northern hemisphere. So clearly showing that the position of the polar front has not been stable through time but has evolved probably uh, from a more north, from a more southerly location to a, from a more northerly location to a more southerly location through the whole scene. Um, RCMG, the Renard Center for Marine Geology, um, is one, has one research focus um, on using high resolution seismic stratigraphy uh, combined also with coring in, in, in select locations to reconstruct the intensity, the position and the stability of bottom ocean currents in certain in areas around the world, particularly in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, going back to the Miocene, so multiple millions of years, because it tells you something about the intensity um, of the ocean thermohaline circulation, yeah? which is basically a pro uh, an indicator for the, the way in which the tropical low latitude climate system is connected to the high latitude climate system yeah, by this global conveyor belt of ocean circulation. 
and of course is important for trying to understand climate change at uh, longer time scales. Another focus of this group um, is, is deals with, again, uh, the history of the last 20,000 years or so um, of the very wet region in, uh, in southwestern South America, um, where a combination of seismics and core data from, uh, from lakes on land and from fjords in the adjacent ocean are used to reconstruct the history of the position um, of the uh, mid-latitude westerly wind belt, which in turn is, is influenced again by uh, the strength of the Antarctic circumpolar currents and the position of the polar front. So you see that all of these topics are a little bit interrelated, um, uh, but differ in their time period of interest. Another uh, type of research uh, focus also at RCMG um, deals with paleo hazards. Uh, paleo hazards like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions uh, and their study region is a tectonically active area uh, of the southern Andes in uh, south central Chile in the lake district there yes where again um, these these types of hazards yeah, are of course important yes for development of society but the instrumental records are not long enough to get an idea what the risk is of a certain magnitude of earthquake occurring in the in the not too distant future and using uh, the characteristic signatures of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions in sediment cores uh, with their positions chosen carefully on the basis of seismic data uh, it is possible to construct uh, basically a long time series of the recurrence interval of those hazards and therefore get a better idea of the likelihood that something like this will happen again in the in the future um, the group of paleontology is trying part of them uh, is trying to look at um, whether the way we think climate dynamics how the world works today um, also applies to periods very far back in time in this particular case 440 million years ago in the Ordovician at a time when of course the position of the continents was totally different than today yes and using uh, the distribution of cold cold loving and warm loving zooplankton taxa uh, preserved in sediments from particular time slices, yes, uh, they are able to reconstruct shifts, uh, in this case in the polar front, yes, which turn out to be not very different from what we see now between glacials and interglacial periods in the late Cenozoic. So in a sense, uh, some of those climate dynamics, even that far back in time, are quite understandable with our modern way of thinking about global climate system. Um, a, same, a similar um, approach is also used for tracking climate change um, um, uh, nearer to the present, yes, um, where fossil dinoflagellate cysts again, uh, the distributions of those shifts in time slices um, at multiple sites are reconstructed, uh, are used to reconstruct uh, changes, for example, in the uh, global cooling uh, during the Miocene, yeah, so in the, with the development of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, with sites um, around um, here west of Ireland, yes, and then um, uh, much more recently again, the last 15 to 20,000 years, um, also in the same sediment cores used by the RCMG, um, looking at those uh, dinoflagellate cysts to also again try to determine the position of the and the intensity of the mid-latitude westerly winds, uh, which in turn tell you something about the strength of the polar of the Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, another focus from paleontology uh, looks at um, environmental control of the evolution and distribution of aquatic mollusks uh, from lakes, particularly in Africa. Uh, and I've taken this particular uh, example, uh, a paper in evolution from a few years back by Bert van Boxlaar, um, which, um, which relates to um, the, the famous um, hypothesis of so-called punctuated equilibrium evolution, which is the abrupt formation of species out of old other species, yes, over quite short periods of quite short period of time. It's a theoretical concept uh, proposed by Gould and Eldridge, yes, which seemed to be demonstrated in with um, by Williamson uh, using the um, the records. Um, of fossil mollusks from the Turkana Basin in northern Kenya um, over the past few million years. Well, um, Bert van Boxlaar was able to show that in fact 
um, that idea seems to be an artifact yeah, um, of an incomplete fossil record in Turkana and where the apparently abrupt uh, change in the shape of certain mollusks yeah, is actually caused by the fact that uh, this lake um, as it was going, the level was going up and down, uh, had a different hydro hydrographic connectivity with other areas which then allowed the immigration of related species to replace the local species rather than that the local species was evolving into a different species. So this publication got quite a bit of positive attention. Uh, and then finally, um, also uh, in the paleontology group, uh, there is a project in collaboration with the archaeologists um, where um, they are looking at the environmental history um, of the landscape of northern Flanders at the time after the Ice Age when the area was populated by hunter-gatherers, so still before the, the introduction of agriculture. And they are doing this uh, by looking at multiple proxies such as pollen and spores and so on um, in uh, trenches across uh, the Paleo Lake um, here uh, in the Moervaart area in northern Flanders. Okay, so after this compilation, let me focus on the unique strengths of our group in Ghent. Th first of all, uh, we do mostly do our own field work, supported by state-of-the-art technology, which leads to the best sites and highest quality sediment cores to address pertinent research questions. Having the best material available um, facilitates linking up with strong international partners because this access to good material seems to be an important bottleneck for robust, robust data and conclusions. Further, we have wide in-house expertise about processes operating on short and long time scales in marine and continental settings, high and low latitudes in both hemispheres. And finally, when we work with biological tracers, dinoflagellates, diatoms, chronomids, ostracos and fungal spores, we have a long tradition of paying attention to taxonomy because good taxon discrimination is still the cornerstone of correct ecological attribution and therefore a good high quality environmental reconstruction. Some examples, yeah? this is uh, the paleohazards work in Alaska um, where with, this, with, with seismic imagery yes, um, is, are determined the distribution of mass transport deposits, landslides so underneath the water of the lake uh, caused by big uh, earthquakes yes, um, and using this data allows to determine exactly the position where a core should be taken to get the most complete, highest quality record of all of those earthquake events. Yes, and without this kind of high quality data, which is done routinely by RCMG, it would be diff very difficult to, to put the core exactly in the right place. Um, in our own work uh, in, in, in East Africa, uh, we have over the years collected modern environmental data from over a hundred lakes, going from high mountain lakes in the Rubenzori, uh, crater lakes in Uganda and Kenya, uh, so saline lakes and freshwater lakes, big rift lakes, yes, uh, allowing us to build up a reference uh, library yes, of, of tracers, of environmental tracers under a wide range of environmental conditions, yes, which can then be used as analogues when finding the same kind of tracers at certain times in the past at individual sites. Thirdly, um, uh, to, to emphasize the focus on taxonomy, yeah, this is an overview yes, of all the different diatom taxa that have been found um, in, um, in biofilms uh, microbial biofilms in East Antarctic lakes and obviously uh, the, the quality of the taxonomic discrimination yeah, um, increases the biodiversity and also increases the accuracy of the ecological um, information derived from them. Good. We, of course we don't work in isolation. Yes, uh, we have important partnerships, collaboration with, with other UG Ghent University groups yeah, um, who don't focus exclusively on global change archives, but who have on offer specific technology. A good example uh, is the group working on, on OSL dating in geology, uh, the group working on micro X-ray fluorescence uh, elemental scanning in analy analytical chemistry, and groups um, in wood technology for identification of fossil charcoal, and 
people having uh, available ground penetrating radar um, at the, in the bioengineering faculty. We also have increasingly intensive collaboration with the um, isotope bio bioscience laboratory of Pascal Books, uh, which I will uh, say a few words about. And then finally, I want to finish uh, by showing that uh, recently um, all of the, different, the, the five different groups uh, focusing on global change archives are now for the first time collaborating in one major project, namely the project Deep Chala, which is currently funded with uh, above GOR, um, in the and which was also will be partly sponsored by the International Continental Drilling Program. Well, I had a collaboration uh, with the Isotope Bioscience Laboratory. Yeah, um, they describe themselves as a comprehensive facility for light element stable isotope analysis um, and applications. Yeah? In the context of global change archives, what is much important is that they can do high throughput yeah? geochemical and biogeochemical analysis on lake and marine sediment cores, plus validation studies on modern day systems. Okay, and so then they are evidently also collaborating in this uh, new big project, ICDP project Deep Chola, where we are trying to reconstruct about 250,000 years, so two complete glacial and glacial cycles of climate and ecosystem dynamics on the equator of East Africa. It is coordinated by Ghent University. Currently there are 40 PIs, 11 countries are involved, uh, and only the field work itself will cost about 1.6 million euros. It has evolved over the last few years and now we've reached a stage where we have official um, approval by the Assembly of Governors of ICDP. So we can start really looking for money to complete the budget. Um, this, the record from Deep Shala is, um, has the potential to really become one of the major signature climate records uh, globally. Um, where the others are the records um, of climate and uh, of temperature change and carbon dioxide concentrations that are extracted from the deep ice cores in Antarctica, Vostok and, and North Grip here in Greenland. Yes, um, showing what the climate dynamics was at high latitudes with the clear 100,000 year cycles. And then at low latitudes currently, records from speleothems, from caves, yeah, showing uh, a 20,000 year cycle um, in the uh, monsoon variability, uh, which is antiphased in the north and the southern hemisphere. So the big question, of course, is what happens at the equator? Well, our preliminary data from Shala, which were published a few years ago in Nature, show that indeed the, the, let's say, the combination of northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere monsoon dynamics creates a mixed signal um, of an 11,000 year cycle of um, climate becoming wetter and drier, which you can see in this record of the last 25,000 25, years, and which we are now going to extend uh, back to 250,000 years. And so this, um, and this record, and so you can see, is already, uh, we can already see um, how the record will more or less look like in the seismic stratigraphy, and our purpose is to drill a sediment core all the way to the bottom of the crater to bring up 250,000 years of climate and, his and environmental history in East Africa. And since um, modern humans have existed for about 200,000 years, um, we will basically produce a history of the landscape and climate in East Africa for the entire period that modern humans have existed. And what's interesting as well is that about 100,000 years ago, it seems that uh, a period of severe drought has occurred, lasting around 15,000 years, which was more severe than even the last glacial maximum about 15,000 years ago. Yes, and this, the timing of this drought more or less corresponds with the timing when we see the first uh, out of Africa two humans appearing in the Middle East and later in, 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 in Europe. So in that sense, we may contribute to solve the mystery why modern humans about 100,000 years ago have left Africa and started spreading around the world. So um, this more or less wraps it up what I was going to present. And so in the name of my colleagues and our postdocs, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>